All these are sandbars. Used to be river boat go up this way, straight up this way. Now all that is river gravel. Bar. The Athabascan are indigenous people. They have survived through subsistence living for thousands of years. They have faced hardships and have successfully developed a positive relationship with their environment. Time and again, the Athabascan people have adapted to change in their region and have proven their resilience. Recent environmental influences from other parts of the globe have made it more difficult to continue a traditional lifestyle. Athabascan people have recognized this change. They are struggling to put it into perspective. It's change, changing fast. Well, our elders say that we were going to face, you know, starvation if we didn't take care of the earth, and this is what's happening now. This was a very, very active village at, at one time. There was a lot of people here, and their main purpose was fish. But right now, with no fish, you don't see any people around. The non-indigenous scientific community has recently become aware of these issues. They are recognizing the value of indigenous traditional knowledge. Well, one feature of the, uh, the weather and climate we've noticed in recent years is an increase of the, uh, the variability. And th this is an interesting topic because it, it was brought to the fore, the, the attention was called to it by the, the indigenous communities throughout the north. Big fire surrounding Fairbanks. As a result, they are joining the fight to reverse the effects of climate change. Uh, Easterly wind covering entire Fairbanks now. So this is a very serious situation. The Athabascan people have learned that there's nothing local about the natural environment. Every system on Earth is tied to every other in a delicate balance. What happens to Athabascan people is certain to impact people in other areas of the world. Canada's Yukon Territory is a land of extremes. It is home to a variety of climates and ecosystems. Much of Yukon is arid, a kind of cold climate near desert. The lowlands of the Arctic coast and alpine plateaus are tundra. Most of the land is hilly and mountainous, with some of the highest peaks and greatest ice fields in North America. The Athabascan people have lived in the areas now known as Alaska and Yukon for thousands of years. Their culture is linked to the local environment. Traditional foods such as fish, berries, and major animals like moose and caribou form the diet of the Athabascan people. Everything required for survival was discovered in nature. You live in Tlaxu, that's what you depend on. This is your store. You have to uh and uh, you have to look after your area. Modern Athabascan people are a product of constant environmental adaptation. The extreme effects of global climate change are impacting their traditional lifestyles and the world around them. The future of the culture hinges on how well they overcome these new challenges. Being so directly connected with the natural world, the Athabascan people had developed an awareness of the changes that are occurring. Weather patterns have become less predictable, challenging traditional knowledge. It's like you can't predict the weather anymore, like we used to. We know all the kind of weather we're going to have. And now it's, it's hard, it's all different every year. Warmer climate rain in the winter than we ever did before. Every year the weather's been changing, like we have warm winters, we have rain when we're not supposed to, and we had snow in July, but we're really not supposed to have, we've never seen before. <laughs> the old mountains and everything what people, some of the elders used to use for weather indicators, that don't work anymore. An increase in storm activity describes the trauma that the Earth is experiencing. Uh, we never used to get lightning and thunder in this area, and now we're getting, um, we're, we're starting to get lightning. And I find that kind of uh, concerning, especially with uh, the status of the, the forest, uh, with the spruce beetle kill going through, killing the softwoods, and then we have a leaf miner going through, killing the hardwoods. 
thunderstorms that we've never seen. That's a big change among our people. Scientists agree with indigenous people about the degree of change. Their studies reveal far-reaching impacts. We've also seen extreme retreats of the summer ice cover. Uh, this is around the western and northern coasts of Alaska. We're referring here to the sea ice cover, the ice cover on the ocean. And associated with that are increased uh, storm events. There seems to be an increasing uh, incidence of storms that lead to coastal flooding and erosion. One of the most dangerous aspects of climate change is the power of the sun. A reduction of ozone and other atmospheric filters has exposed the Earth and its inhabitants to dangerous levels of solar ultraviolet radiation. In the ice fields itself, um, from the time we started up there until now, when you do get hot periods, it's very intense heat. It's really hot, like you can get burnt up there very, very easily without wearing long sleeve coats and, and some kind of sunblock or sunglasses and hats. Um, you can get completely fried in a very short time. There's a lot more people getting skin cancer around here because there's higher UV radiation. They, they, we've had warnings around here that we need to wear our sunglasses more because uh, the UV radiation out. The sun does not distinguish young from old. Its powerful rays are particularly dangerous to Athabascan elders. I, I can't remember which year, but uh, when it began to, the, the sun seemed hot. Maybe five, six years ago, I had a rash here. Youth today can expect to receive a 30% higher dose of UV than their parents, increasing their risk of developing skin cancer. Their eyesight is also threatened. The security of Athabascan traditional foods, from berries to caribou, is threatened by a changing climate. As the local ecosystem is disrupted, native plant and animal species risk disappearing. Springtime, all the caribou got killed by the ice too. You, know? you see a lot of dead caribou alongside the river. Yeah. I used to go. One time I see about over 10 caribou, dead caribou alongside the river. I just had them. Uh, you look at the mountain goat in the back here, they moved entirely away from here because the, uh, because the vegetation has grown too high for them and mountain goat are quite wary, they like to be up in the rocks, so they move away from the ranges. You know, there's a whole vast of changes taking place, even your sheep back here, our people used to have sheep on both sides, and right now you haven't seen sheep here for the last three years. So your sheep have moved away from the entire area. It's becoming more of a coastal influence here. Many water systems are warmer and contain substances that are leaching out of a melting permafrost base. Fish have difficulty adapting. The salmon are not coming back to the warm streams. They're looking for colder glacier-fed creeks that they can uh, uh, spawn in. They need a certain temperature temperature of spring water to keep their eggs eggs going for the winter time so you know all of these things play a play a real hectic role on the, on the uh, fish our salmon came in real early that usually come in September month it came in uh, it already came in native species that still remain are often not of the same quality as they used to be and are not as plentiful it seems to me that it don't taste the same. It's just everything is different. The fish, I don't know, it's, it's more like it's uh, been in the water too long, the fish is. Isn't it like, it's, like it used to be? It's kind of soft. I don't know what's causing that. The meat isn't the same. It's. Uh, It just seems to be different. And the salmon run was real low, and most of the fish we got this year was and they've been full grown. Uh, most of the reds didn't come in, and uh, 
changes we see is that our fish uh, racks used to be full all the time. Three, four hundred fish drying at the time. It takes forty fish to make a bale and there we barely even made enough to you know, make a couple of bales of fish per family. The shortage and poor quality of traditional foods has had the undesirable effect of forcing many Athabascan peoples to shift their diet to store-bought foods. This increases the health risks to Aboriginal people. It may lead to illness such as diabetes and cancer. Athabascan people are increasingly at risk of losing their hunting culture. The damaged ecosystem makes it difficult to go on the land and harvest traditional foods. In springtime, all night is warm. There's, it don't get cold to travel. It's hard for people to travel to Crow Flat. Like this spring, the ice went early in May. How are we going to be able to get fish and game in the future? How are my kids going to be able to do it? The effects of climate change threaten the culture and lives of the Athabascan people. At the root of this threat is the changing environment. While impacts on Aboriginal people may be local, a changing environment has an impact on the world at large. Glaciers are remnants of a bygone age, when no trace of humanity was present in the world. These frozen giants from the past are now threatened with extinction through human activity. We know that climate is, is changing. On the other hand, we know that climate's always changed. It's never quite the same. But it seems that there is something more going on here. We hear about the shrinkage of the glaciers in the park, in Kluani National Park. We see here the ice patches. They're shrinking in size. And with that shrinkage, we're finding the artifacts, things that people lost when they were hunting hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. I do a lot of flying, and up the Connect River the last two years, the, the glacier has been just breaking off in great big chunks, two, three hundred feet at a time, which it hasn't done in years. Melting glaciers and high mountain ice patches have a massive impact on ecosystems locally and globally. The melt is higher, and uh, the glacier runoff is higher too. Uh, I think uh, the evidence of that certainly uh, is in the lake here uh, because it's mostly glacier fed and uh, lake levels, this, this is sort of maximum melt time and lake levels have consistently been high at this time of year so it's catching a great deal more water from, uh, from the main glaciers feeding it. So there's a huge indication that uh, you're going to get a lot of melt off. You look at the White River system, the uh, Casca Walch, there's a lot of uh, muddy water, glacial till that's being pumped down the system. I have a lot of relatives across in Haines, Alaska, and, and uh, they're having a hard time down there also catching fish. And they notice the uh, temperature change in the oceans. The runoff water affects fisheries and streams nearby. It also raises the surface levels of oceans around the world. We're seeing the retreat of glaciers on a fairly uh, wide basis through southern Alaska and even in the smaller glaciers up in the Brooks Range. One of the conclusions from the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment was that the Alaskan glacier melt is actually contributing substantially to the rise of global sea level. In fact, there are some estimates that the Alaskan glaciers may even be contributing more than the Greenland ice sheet, which is a much larger volume of ice. As glaciers disappear, the natural water sources of the Athabascan people are threatened. And the glacier is melting more and more. The rivers, some of the big rivers are drying up. Uh, the people the human race got to find out where they're going to start getting water. The disappearance of glaciers increases the rate at which climate change occurs. 
The bright white surface reflects light and heat away from the Earth. As these natural mirrors disappear, more heat is trapped in the atmosphere. Rising temperatures in the Arctic region can even reshape the landscape itself. Permafrost is melting. The permanent layer of frozen Earth just below the surface of most of the North is disappearing. This destabilizes the land and everything on it. The erosion is terrible, especially out in Butte. I got a friend of mine out there, that his house is just about ready to fall in the river. It's about, oh, I think it's 50 feet away now, and they're going to try to move it today, move it back away from the, and he just built it, big house. Uh, the warming has been going on for the last 30 or 40 years and we're seeing the, the effects of degrading permafrost um, in, in some, of the, uh, some of the areas in the interior of Alaska. We're, we're seeing it in the, the roads and in some of the infrastructure, but also in the uh, undisturbed areas are also showing the, uh, the, the warming effects. The Tanana Flats are one region uh, in which areas of trees can be, can be uh, seen in their uh, so they're post-permafrost phase. They're actually slumping and, and, and tipping over in some areas. Melting permafrost also increases the amount of water that can be absorbed by the tundra. Lakes are disappearing and rivers are being sucked into the ground. They could go across so fast eh? and you can't get that to it. Water low, they just go across, pass, so that's the way you, you can't get them so easy. Eh? It's high water. you. Can right up to it. Now all that is ever gravel. Last year, I saw how much climate change. That boat back there in my, by my house, I didn't put it in. So low water last year. The water is so low in the uh, porcupine that it's drained all the water from the other area just to keep the porcupine moving. You can't even, it's not even a foot of water some places. This lake filmed in 1996 no longer exists. Melting permafrost opened a channel and the lake emptied into the river. Now the permafrost is melting, getting lower. In account of that, they're sucking up all the water in the lakes and the lakes are going dry. Melting permafrost also releases gases into the atmosphere that have been trapped in the frozen earth for millennia. This introduces a vicious cycle of increased climate change that will, in turn, melt more permafrost at a faster rate. If permafrost is unique to the Arctic, even more unique are the Yukon's plants and animal species. The changing climate has already altered their habitat, forcing many species into new regions and reducing their numbers. 80,000 caribou one hurt going to Pocopalu. That's a lot of caribou. Over four miles long of the three mile height. Where's all the caribou go? Two years ago, all the blueberry patches got dried out, and you couldn't hardly pick blueberries in a lot of areas. And you'd walk around up there, and it was like walking on crunchy vegetable matter, and it's not supposed to be. It's normally kind of marshy and wet and you get your feet wet. The warming climate invites new animals into the Arctic from more temperate climates, forcing out native species. This, about 10 years back, they start coming in, somewhere around there. Some of the birds are disappearing too. Never hear them again. Armicans, I only seen four last time. Deer start moving north. And I guess the moose, moose keep moving north too. Gophers, they were completely wiped out and that's a major food for grizzly bears.
Particularly distressing to everyone in the far north is the changing forest. New species are moving in, squeezing out the old. Brush everywhere now, where there used to be just tundra. So that's just like a rainforest coming up, you know. I know as a kid, when I came through this area here, I used to walk in from Dalton Post into Tlukshu on the old, uh, on the old trail. Shawashe Tun, they call it. And uh, now they call it the Dalton Trail. But that trail there used to be wide open. You could follow it easily, and it was wide open meadows all the way through. Now you can't even walk through it because the vegetation has grown, filled in so, so fully that uh, you don't know which trail you're actually on. The willows in the land itself is, is getting thicker right here in Yukon. Like all the trails that I, we used to go through when we were younger are start growing in. They start, and the willows are getting taller. In the trees, uh, it's just getting thick. As native species suffer the effects of a warming climate, they make easy prey for new insects that feed on their flesh and foliage. You see them poplar trees, their leaves are turned and silver. They should be green, but they're silver. They have little, uh, little bugs eating the leaves, eating the, the layers of the leaves off and turning them silver. We, uh, we have an infestation going through that's uh, killing off uh, the, the conifers and um, uh, basically the hardwoods and the softwoods are being um, infestated with insects and they're big heavy water drinkers and when those are removed you're going to have more surface runoff. Um, so we're going to be feeling the ramifications of the, the state of our forest for years to come. No woodpeckers. This last year they saw one. And that's what keeps the uh, spruce, spruce beetles under control. And uh, the spruce bark beetle gets into the bark and it kills the trees. And as you look at this valley right here, if you look at the dark spruce trees, those are the dead spruce trees. And if it was to catch fire at one end of this valley or the other, the wind, if you see the wind blowing on the trees, would carry it very rapidly from one end to the valley to the other. And with all of that fuel from the dead spruce trees, it would be very devastating. The dead trees that insects leave behind are tinder dry. The incidence of forest fire also increases as weather patterns change. In both of the past uh, two summers, we, we've had wet spells, which creates a large uh, vegetative base, large amount of uh, potential fire uh, fuel for the fire, so to speak. And then we've had long dry spells in both those summers. That, that juxtaposition or mix of dry spells and wet spells is one example of the, the increased variability, and we, we are seeing the consequences right now in the, uh, in, in the fire season that we're experiencing. Impacts on the environment are most noticeable when viewed locally. It's easy to observe new species that move into an ecosystem or to see the increased water in a river from a melting glacier. Harder to observe are the wider reaching impacts of climate change. These demonstrate how intrinsically linked the various environmental regions of the world are. When you look around other parts of the world, it's also happening. You have floods and hurricanes and Many of things that's happening that's due to global warming. So one of the, uh, the ironies is that the, the message is not being driven home uh, to the extent we would hope down in the lower 48. The Athabascan live very close to a land that is particularly sensitive to the effects of climate change. In the Arctic, they recognize the change now. It is already affecting their lifestyle and culture. We're directly connected with the environment. We are the environment. Uh, we fuse with each breath. We fuse with the environment. The Arctic is the front line of a changing climate, and its effects will be felt around the globe. The Athabascan people recognize this and are working on the international stage through groups like the Arctic Athabascan Council 
to stop and reverse the effects of climate change. The real payoff will come at the, at the national level, where policymakers and the legislators uh, have a responsibility to the, uh, to the peoples of the North and to the rest of the world. And perhaps the most effective strategy uh, by individuals is to convince the policymakers at the national and the international levels that changes are occurring and that responses are needed. Until such time as the correct balance of the environment can be returned, the Athabascan people are using the skill that has allowed them to survive for thousands of years, the ability to adapt. The elders have talked about this for a long time, that they used to warn people, you watch out, there's going to be a change. Things is going to change. Everything is going to change, the weather, you name it, everything's going to start changing, but that's, as long as you, you learn to uh, adjust with it, it'll all pass again. It could very well be the beginnings of hard times for many people, unless we figure out how to adapt, which we've adapted in the past, which is why we're still here. So, all I have to say, good luck to everybody. As the global community struggles with the changing environment, the Athabascan people will continue to do their best to survive and thrive. Hey, 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 hey,